I didn't get it get it done. Very important. I, I don't know about you this morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here this morning. I'm privileged to be here this morning. I thank God for it. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter number 7. Uh, when you think of Second Chronicles chapter number 7, the first thing you normally think about is verse number 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. All right? That's, but that's not where we've been going with this. It's very important this morning that I get finished uh, what I had to finish. Let me find my handkerchief. Where is it? Is it in my pocket? It's in my pocket. All right? Got to get that out. Amen. Notice nobody sits on these front two, two pews. You ever notice that? They're the splash. They're the splash seats. Amen. Years ago, when uh, we went to uh, Sea World, they had a killer whale by the name of uh, what's her name? Shamu. Yeah. And what happened was when she came around that big thing full of water, buddy. I mean, tell you, the water went over the sides of that thing. Amen. They had splash pews. Amen. So I keep this out just for that. And also, I'll keep a watch out so I'll know what time it is so you don't have to look at your watch. Ain't nobody got to tell me what time it is. So we get out on time. Be bad. Second Chronicles chapter number 7. He deals with the fire coming down in this particular place. Uh, they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of God. This is Solomon's temple, by the way. There were two temples. Solomon's temple was built here and then later it was destroyed by the Babylonians when they came in, took them captivity for seven years. Then they sent back Nehemiah to build the walls, Ezra to rebuild the temple. And this is called Zerubbabel's temple, the second one. But this is Solomon's temple, most beautiful, ornate building that has ever been built. Made out of pure Gold, not 14 karat gold, not 24 karat gold, but 99.99.99% pure gold. As pure as you can get the gold built out of this. So we find in here that God did something. Now, they brought that Ark of the Covenant back. Chapter 6, Solomon prayed a beautiful prayer of dedication of the house. He dedicated that thing to God. Boy, in front of all the people, the leader of Israel got down on his knees and lifted his hands to heaven and prayed a seven-minute prayer to God. And when he got done, if you look in verse number 1, the Bible said, When Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled that house. Look at verse 2. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves and their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Three times in the Scripture that God's fire came down. There's other times when the fire of God came out of heaven, but I'm talking about in His approval, in His presence, with His power upon a, a house. Two mentions are in the Old Testament, and both times that fire fell upon a building. If you go back to the tabernacle of the congregation. I think I wrote the verses down here. It was an assembly, a place of sanctification. But over in Leviticus chapter 9, it said this, And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. This was a sanctuary set aside for the worship of God. 
That's what a sanctuary is. It's a place that is specifically set aside for a specific purpose. Now, when they set a place aside for a sanctuary, you can't go there and do just anything you want to do. I talked about, I think it's Lake Monticello, just north of Columbia down here. Went down there to fish. Hey, that's where all of these Canadian geese that don't ever go to Canada... Uh, it's always amazed me, Canadian geese, but they're all over South Carolina. If you play golf, you'll find out what I mean. They're all over these golf greens. They leave them little droppings just everywhere they go. So you get down there, they got islands out there to where these islands out in Lake Monticello is where they go out and lay their eggs. So there's signs all out in the water that you can't get within, I think, 200 yards or something like that of these islands because they're a sanctuary for these geese. It's a something set aside. So the first was the tabernacle of the congregation. The second one we find here in Solomon's temple. A building, a place to where the people of God gathered together. The people of God assembled together here to worship God and the fire fell here. The third time the fire, the fire falls is in the New Testament, but it for the first time does not fall on a building. The fire of God fell upon a body. The fire of God fell upon the people of God. Acts chapter number 2. Let me read you a verse of Scripture. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. The fire fell upon individuals. Now, let me make a statement before you kind of get off or think I'm off this morning. We are not fire baptized Baptists, all right? This was a one-time act where the power of God fell upon the people of God individually in the New Testament. Now, if you go to the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon men and the Spirit of God left men. You remember a man by the name of Samson. When the Spirit of God came upon him, and by the way, he was not nine feet tall, weighed 450, 500 pounds. He was just a normal man. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been such a miracle. This normal man, when the Spirit of God came upon him, could lift the gates up off of a city and carry them off. We're talking about something that was supernatural. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God didn't indwell the believers, but He empowered them at times. He came upon the believers, and then He was not in these believers. That's why David made this statement in Psalm 51, his penitent psalm. He said, Take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. So we find the power of God came, but it didn't reside. Now, when you get to the New Testament church, the power and approval and presence of God fell upon believers, not a building. Now, they were assembled in an upper room, 120 of them, so they were sanctified. These people were praying together. They were waiting for the fullness of the Spirit of God to come, and when He did, that Spirit began to with, dwell within the heart and life of God's people. You see, we don't need to pray for the Spirit of God. The minute you got saved, the Holy Ghost of God came into your life. The Bible says if you have not the Spirit of God, you're none of His. We've got the Holy Ghost on the inside. Hey, thank God I'll never walk alone as a believer. I am saved and sanctified and at times filled with the Holy Ghost when I'm completely filled and let Him use me. This is not something of speaking in tongues and all this. Listen, that stopped when you got your Bible. Friend, we don't need extra biblical, that means outside of the Word of God, revelation today. If you want to know what God thinks, you pick this up and read it. If you want to know what God thinks you ought to be doing, you pick the Bible up and read the Bible. There's no contradiction in the Word of God. There's no contradiction with God. And we have the Spirit of God living on the inside. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Thank God for that. 
So we find three times that power fell. Now what I dealt with last week was with what the people did, because I'm going to bring that down to the church. What is the church? You've got a church that is local, and then you've got the church that is a body. Every born-again child of God is in the body of of Christ. Now you go to Ephesians chapter number 5, he calls it the church. Nothing wrong. Church just simply means a called out assembly to worship. We are a church local this morning. We came out of the world to worship God here in this place. One of these days, there's going to be a trump sound from heaven, friend, and the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ, that is their bodies. See, He's going to bring those that are saved with Him. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. Listen, these cemeteries, they are full of dead people. You don't have to be scared walking through a cemetery. That's one place they ain't going to hurt you. All right? People walk through, you know, looking over the shoulder and they can't even whistle. Their tongues are swollen. You know, eyes all bugged out. We, we used to watch all this stuff. Nobody going to hurt you. What's happening when He brings them down from heaven with Him when He comes in to rapture the church, those bodies are going to be changed and meet them and they're going to have an eternal body. The Bible said we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of the eye. And then we which are alive, that, hey, that word alive means that you're saved. And remain, that means that you're not dead yet, all right? We're going to be called up together with them. The Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So what happens is we've got the Spirit of God. So the church is a beautiful type of what took place in the Old Testament. Under atonement, they look forward to Christ. As the church of the living God, we look back at Christ. They look forward to the cross. We look back to the cross. Both were saved by faith in the coming of the Messiah. What a blessing. Now, we saw what they did in verse number 3. The Bible said they all worshipped. I hope you came here this morning to worship. Huh? Worship God. Praise. Hey, listen. Just worship God. Is he wor- You know what the word worship? It comes from actually two words, worship. It seems it's giving back to God what He's worth to you, all right? That's what worship is. Then they all sacrificed in verse number 4. Then they all dedicated in verse number 5. Verse 6, they all reverenced. And verse number 8, they all assembled. Now, what is the local church this morning? It's a place of worship. Listen, we didn't come here this morning to entertain you. If you want entertainment, turn on the comedy channel. I'm sure some of them people can entertain. Now, you want entertainment, then you go out and you listen to entertainment or whatever you think. We're not here for that this morning. We are here to give Him what He's worth. It's a place of sacrifice. Thank God for those that, that, that sacrifice. Listen, this is between you and God, not me and you. I don't know what you give. I don't want to know what you give. It's none of my business. The only thing I know is they send me, I get the totals. And I send that to Betty to be put in here. They gave. I thank God this morning for the privilege and the joy of tithing. I thank God for that. Listen, I've been a tither almost all of my spiritual life. I was saved 45 years ago this coming November. I sat on the back pew of a church, asked God to forgive me and save me. Barbara Lynn got a brand new husband that night. Friend, I got saved. S-A-V-E-D. Amen. I got born into the family of God. God changed my life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Huh? Started tithing. Started giving. Haven't missed a tithe in 40. 
five years. I have not missed. We go out of town. Hey, we put our tithe in preemptively or whatever. Amen. But I'm talking about a place. It was a place where they sacrificed. It was a place that they dedicated. This church is not dedicated to play basketball or football or ping pong or soccer or anything else in here. When you come in this, this is not an auditorium. It is a sanctuary. Dedicated. These are God's pews. This is God's pulpit area. God's choir. God's lights. God's fans. God's air conditioning. You behave or He might cut it off. <laughs> hey man, anybody lost your power here late? Oh, let me tell you something. I don't know how we made it back in the 50s. We had four season air conditioning in the car. Everybody knows what that's in the little wing vents. Boy, I wish they hadn't have done away with those things. You can turn that little wing vent in and the boy got the best air coming through that car, son. We stayed comfortable. Hey, we laid in beds at night and we kept them wet. And I'm not talking about in the wrong way. We knew what sweat was. Old saying, horses sweat, men perspire, and women glow. <laughs> we, just, we just did. Amen. Hey, it, it was a dedicated place. It was a place of prayer. Jesus said, my house shall be called what? Now, He didn't say a. He said the. You say, what's the difference? The difference between an indefinite article and a definite article. Now, if you know anything about English, A and N are indefinite articles. This is a book. Hmm? A definite article is the. This is the book. <laughs> Do you get the difference? Amen. And my house shall be called the house of prayer. That's why Wednesday night we call all these names out. Read all these names from prayer list. Pray. Pray. We pray. We pray before a service, during the prayer service, after the service. I hope you're praying during the service. It's a place of prayer. And then we find that it's a place of preaching. Teaching the Word of God. I try to rightly divide the word of truth. When you come in here for Sunday school, I try to feed you something from the Bible before you leave here. Give you something to hold on to. That's what I'm going to do this morning. It's a place to where the word of God is magnified above all of God's name. Psalms 138 verse number 2. You want to know what God thinks about the Bible. He said, I have magnified my word above all my name. And the Bible said that there's no name under heaven, friend, like Jesus Christ. God said, but I put my word above my name. Why? Because you are never any better than your word. Used to people stood on their word. Rightly devised place of spiritual growth. Thank God for 45 years and I'm still growing in Jesus Christ. Still growing. Still growing. Thank God. I'm getting older. I'm getting feebler. I can't move around as good. I get out of bed. I fall back in. <laughs> Isn't that a blessing? Just get out of bed. I don't sit on the side of a bed. If I sit on the side of the bed, I forget if I'm getting up or going to bed, so I give myself the benefit of the doubt and I lay back down. Amen. Hey, I'm talking about it's a place of growth. It's a place of missions. Thank God for that board back there. There's about a hundred missionaries back there that we support and take care of and love and pray for, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Listen, most of these churches, they take up a mission offering about once or twice a year. Almost 60% of what comes in that offering plate will go into the mission field. We don't take up special offerings for missions. We do missions. We give to missions. We think, hey, thank God, and it's a place where God meets with His kids. Now, I want to show you what the people had real quick this morning. What did they have? Hey, we see what they did, all right? Thank God for what you're doing. 
But I want to see what we have, not just what we are doing. You know, you can do without having. We live in days of religion where people go to church everywhere. They got a do, but they don't have a done. They do things, and they may even do them in a right manner. You know, religious people sometimes, they kind of follow the rules of the Bible to a degree, and they've got religion, but they don't know Jesus Christ. I want you to see what these people had. I understand they had Solomon's temple and all its glory, and the power of God, the approval of God, the presence of God fell on that place. But he said that they had some things. One, I want you to look in verse number 1 through 3. They had His glory in that place. I'm not going to reread them, but I want you to notice what he said. And, and he said this. He said that the glory of the Lord in verse 1 filled the house. Now what's he talking about the glory of the glo- Lord? I think that that's when the presence of God is so real in here because you brought Him with you. Did you realize, hey, God was always in that temple. He was always, hey, He met with them on that mercy seat in there. We bring God with us. That's why Psalms 100, you know, he said, Come into his presence with singing, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Bless his holy name. You know, thank, hey, did you bring anything with you this morning? Huh? You get up aggravated, what day is You ever get up, you're just discommodulated. Now, you young people don't understand that big word. That means you're about as confused as a termite in a yo yo. Yeah, you get that, hey, you're going to find out your mind don't work as good when you get older. You may, hey, you may think it's working good, but it's not working like you think it's working. You know, I drive down the road sometimes, and I'm talking to the Lord, and all of a sudden, I don't know what road I'm on or where I'm going. Now, you young people don't know anything about that, do you? Because, see, you got your cell phone up here. You know exactly where you're going. Huh? Huh? I'll be glad when they enable that app that will not allow you to do anything on that cell phone until you turn the engine off on the car. Now, it's going to cause a lot of problems in traffic because they're going to get up to 100 miles an hour and cut the motor off so they can text until it gets down to about 40. These people are locked. I watch them walking around. <laughs> Don't they, they? They bump into you in Walmart. They run over you. They push buggies over you. Run cars over you. They're on the wrong side of the road. They just boy, they got that thing going on. They bam. Let me tell you something. We need what we bring in with us. I want you to understand that. We need the glory of God in the house of God. The second thing they had, verse number 3, they had gratefulness. They fell to the pavement and worship, praising the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. Let me ask you a question this morning. Has God been good to you? I'm going to deal with that tonight. You know what psalm we got tonight? Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Boy, we're going to go down through that. Let me tell you something. I am grateful. Every time I sat on that deck, God gave us that property. Every time I sat down and ate, God gave me that food. Somebody asked, a man one time saw him blessing his food at a restaurant, and the waitress came up and said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Kentucky. Hey, you got to learn to talk Kentucky, all right? I had to learn to talk South Carolina. Down here they got crappy. What in the world's a crappy? We got crappie. You say, what's the difference? Crappies about that long you throw it back. Crappie are them big slab crappies and you can't keep anything under 12 inches in length. Oh, now you're talking about crappie. Hey, Kentucky, 
Said, Does everybody bless the food where you come from? He said, No, ma'am. He said, The hogs don't. <laughs> grateful. These people were grateful to see the power and the presence of God fall on this place that they had had a part in constructing. They were glad, grateful. Boy, we live in days where people just, they're not grateful anymore. You know, they've got all of this, uh, uh, what, what they call that mentality, uh, where is your, everything's just supposed to belong to you by default, all right? My daddy told me one thing this world owes you, boy, and that's they owe you a job. J-O-B. You go out and get you a job, boy. You know, I, when I was a little bitty fella, I'm talking about this tall, hey, I'd go out and I would get poke salad. Anybody know what poke salad is? I'd get these big old brown pa- bag. Now, I couldn't get them great big old broad leaves because them veins are about as big as your finger running through there and they're tough. I got those tender leaves. I filled that thing and pressed it down and filled it and pressed it down until you couldn't. You press it and it'd sponge back up. And I made sure they got, I got a dollar for that. Hey, that's a pretty good lick. When I was a boy that tall, I was pushing a lawnmower all around town, had my little gas jug hanging on the handlebars. You know, back then it had them handle up bars on it where you hang something on it. They don't have it anymore. But I, I hung on there. I had my little hand clippers. I got 75 cents to mow a yard, a dollar to mow a big yard, and a dollar and a quarter. To, hey, I mow a football field for a dollar and a quarter. I used to shovel snow, rake leaves. One time I cleaned a house. You ladies are tough. I remember Ms. DeVelder. You remember Ms. DeVelder? Polly DeVelder was her husband. He owned a store downtown, on, right down by the, the stop sign. You know, stop sign. That's that little old coal mine camp. And Ms. DeVelder, one time I mowed their yard, and boy, she, you know, always, you know, she had this kerchief on, you know, boy. And, and she said, I need somebody to help me to spring house clean, and I'll pay you to do that. I said, oh, man. Money. Oh, son, I showed up the next morning with my kerchief on. No, I didn't put one of them on. Amen. I left that Miss Polly. I showed up for work. Whew. I had I stripped floors. I clean windows. I, I still don't clean windows and strip floors. I hey let, that woman burnt me out for a lifetime. I worked that day like a dog. I've never, hey, I would have mowed a thousand yards just to get away from Miss DeVelder. I'll never forget, she gave me my money. You know, she was a good biblical woman. She didn't uh, uh, keep money from me. She gave me my my money, and she said, I'll see you in the morning at 7 o'clock. I said, yes, ma'am. I lied like a dog. Matter of fact, I never went back to cut her yard anymore because I'd done lied to her about coming back. Hey, let me tell you, you women are tougher than a light or not. I told somebody Barbara quit work 51 years ago and hadn't hit a lick of a snake since. Let me tell you, she worked hard. Boy, they, they were grateful for what they had. And then, friend, they were giving. Verses 4 through 9. Thank God. I'm going to get off of that real quick. But let me go to verse 10. They had gladness. You say, what in the world is the difference between gratefulness and gladness? You can be grateful and not be glad. Never seen so many people today that are discouraged. And listen, I'm not complaining. Friend, let me tell you something. That is a worldwide epidemic. It's in the pulpits. The number one reason preachers quit preaching is they quit preaching because of discouragement. They get their eyes on numbers out here instead of keeping their eyes on God. They get their eyes on money out here instead of keeping their eyes on God. You know, David encouraged himself in the Lord. You say, preacher, you ever get discouraged? Not bad. (laughs) Hey, I'm not going to lie to you this morning. 
do you get discouraged? Every time you get up and go to work, you're discouraged, right? I'm not, I'm not lying to you. We get up and do what we need to do. I had another preacher tell me this the other day, and I hate it when they do that. He said, I preach every Sunday and I quit every Monday morning. I have never quit on Monday morning or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday or Sunday or Monday or Tuesday. When he said that, he said that, and I, I heard that in Bible college, came in and threw their briefcase down and said, I ain't going back. I'm not going to do that. You know, you know what? They weren't glad I'm glad this morning God allows an old man like me to preach the Word of God in His pulpit, in His church, to His sheep. I couldn't wait until Brother Max got gone. Had a good time with Brother Max, but I'm going to tell you what, I don't like to be out of this pulpit. Do you know how many Sundays I miss? The only Sundays that I have ever missed being in this church was when one of our loved ones died in Kentucky. In 35 years, folks. Now, I may miss a Wednesday about three times a year and I get somebody to fill in and that's fine. All right, we go to Kentucky and see our folks. But let me tell you something. I love this place. Max told on me. I'm going to be careful what I tell Max. You know, I talked about that thing going out west. I've always wanted to take a month and go out west and drive down every canyon across every desert, see every petrified tree, fly through the Grand Canyon, all this stuff. You say, when are you going to do that? Nada. Because I told him I love my church too much to be out of the pulpit for four weeks while I'm going around looking at God's creation. Hey, I love what I'm doing. These people had gladness. They were not just happy about Hey, they were glad. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. Do you hear what that verse said? Then in verses 12 through 14, they had guidance. <laughs> oh, oh. if my people oh thank God you know sometimes you get out of the will of God anybody ever got out of the will of God let me ask it the other way anybody here that never has been out of the will of God we don't have any perfect people in here right Gant huh if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. Listen, He gave us guidance. You know what this Bible does to us? It guides us. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. Thank God for my Bible. Amen. I've got guidance in here. We've got guidance. But the last thing, verse 15 and 16... And I like this, they had God. Look at verse 15. Now mine eyes shall be up open and mine ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Did you know you can have a church without God? You can have a church without God. They're, they're, they're different churches, denominations, friend. I know what they believe. God's not within 10 miles of there unless they got a Bible-believing church someplace. I know what their doctrine is, son. It's not just anti-little bit here and there. It's in anti-salvation. It's anti-Jesus Christ. It's anti... They don't believe in hell. They don't believe they have the Word of God. They don't believe in salvation by grace through faith alone. God's not in there. I don't care how big their building is. God's not impressed with the edifice. God is impressed with what's in there. This little church has God in it. We've got God. He doesn't make me walk on the tops of the pews. I'd break both legs and a hip. Old Harold wouldn't be in near as bad a shape as I was. He'd preach and go run. I've seen him run across tops and pews. God never told me to do that. 
When I was in the military, them air, them airborne guys, I never could see the sense of jumping out of a perfectly good aircraft. Huh? Just never had ah. They had God. You see, God anointed His people, not His building. You say why? Because in the New Testament they don't have one tabernacle, they don't have one temple. They've got a multitude of people that believe. Listen, don't think you're alone. There are churches all around America and all over this world that have God. They may not be running 5,000 or 10,000. Somebody asked me one time, you know that sword, I call it sword of the Lord mentality. They asked me, how many are you running? I said, a little over 75,000. I ain't catching very many of them, but I'm a running them. Hey, man, I'm chasing them around the county. Hey, man, them, them religious people can run fast and you pray. The other morning I went and had some work done on an automobile and I got to stand there for 20 minutes and present the gospel of Jesus Christ to those workers there and they were open to it. One young man told me I was raised Baptist and Methodist but he said I've never heard about being saved. I thought, what? That's not saying all Baptist and Methodist churches are bad. Never heard that somebody would be saved. You say, well, what about the Methodists? You ever heard of George Whitfield? Anybody heard George Whitfield? Started the revivals, fires burning across the south. John and Charles Wesley. Hey, they had some old great preachers. Yeah, they had a little theology difference here and there, but friend, but they preached to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The only way to heaven. My great uncle was an old Methodist. He was a steward in the church. They didn't have church that often. They had a preacher that had eight churches. So he preached at one in the morning, one at night, one in the morning, one at night. I don't know what he did. I, I hope he took the, the fifth Sunday off. I don't know what he did the fifth Sunday. Uncle George E. brought the messages. I can still see him standing up there bringing the messages. When my mama died, I'll, I'll never forget, I stood down there talking to Uncle George E. And he had a daughter there. She was one of these modern people. And Uncle George, he said this. He said, the people today don't even know the gospel. He said, I'm saved because of my faith in Jesus Christ Himself. Hey, Baptist churches today. That young man went to a Baptist church and thought he was saved because he was baptized. They had God. You be thankful for what you've got this morning. You be thankful for what you've got. Oh, you can be entertained a whole lot better than to hear me get up here. But we've got the Word of God in our hands and we herald and magnify that Word of God that we've got in our hands this morning. We preach it and we try to run by it. The presence and power of God, where is it this morning? It's in you. Not in the walls of this building. And when you come, you bring God with you when you come. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to have an invitation. Church is a special place. But the church are special people. Washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you need to come this morning, you come. Thank God this morning that I'm saved. Know it. 